Yeah, it's interesting to uh, I I just I uh, did a, a quick Google there about about how many uh, US companies or like tech companies basically are, are reliant um on on China. So and this this may be uh, like slightly out of date, but what I found um it was that uh, 19 high-tech uh, US companies were found to have direct collaborations with Chinese military or state-owned enterprises. So that includes Dell, Google, IBM, Intel, Microsoft, uh, Synopsys, Merrill Lynch. I'm not sure why they're included in this, but um, it's uh, really interesting. To do, do you think? Do you think it's? Do you think that's dangerous for the U.S. generally? Like, do do, do in in this sort of new Cold War, is it is it worrying that U.S. companies are are that reliant on China, or is that just sort of the world we live in? Well, increasingly, the United States has got, they've got this thing called the entity list, entities of concern. And it's mostly Chinese companies, but not exclusively. Um, so anything that is linked to the Chinese military in particular um, or is otherwise suspect is added to this list. And United States firms are banned from doing deals with these entities. Um, of course, you know, front companies could be established to get around these kinds of these kinds of um, these kind of restrictions on the Chinese side. I mean, um, the, the fact is that, you know, American technology has been absolutely fundamental to the development of China. And it remains fundamental to the development of China. In fact, they want to, you know, the Chinese have become the great defenders of open borders and free trade uh, of globalization because they need continued access to foreign markets for their exports and foreign technology to upgrade their economy. They can't become self-reliant overnight, even as they are the Made in China 2025 program, which was launched in 2015, does aim at much greater self-sufficiency and technological upgrading in a, in a whole host of um, strategic areas. So there is this kind of weird interdependence, a deep interdependence that has emerged. You know, we used to talk back in sort of round about 2008, I think the historian Neil Ferguson d uh, dubbed the term, uh, dubbed it Chimerica, China and America, that it had become a, a single economic entity. They become so closely coupled to one another. Um, and others used to talk about the G2, the group of two, because, you know, really these were the, the big heavyweights that were going to dictate the way the world went. And that's a big difference from the first Cold War because, uh, you know, the Soviet Union and the United States were not economically interdependent at all. There was very limited economic interaction between the two blocs during the Cold War. Whereas this second Cold War is emerging in a context of hyper-globalization. Now, hyper-globalization has given way to what's called slobalization, right? So the the share of world GDP, the, the share of um, the, the share of world GDP that's constituted by trade is now flatlining after increasing for for a long time. Um, really? So the degree of integration, the pace of integration, seems to have slowed down. But the backdrop is decades of really immense integration of supply chains, of production networks of uh, ownership and control across across borders. Um, now, the two economies, the United States and China, they are starting to decouple, but it's very slow and it's quite wrenching. Um, and a lot of the actors that are involved that are making money out of it don't really want to step back from it on either side. So it's very difficult to disentangle. It's definitely not as it's not as easy as just slapping tariffs on China and <laughs> seeing what happens. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, so before we get to the tariffs, um, I just wanted to to I saw I, I asked I asked Grok if China has succeeded with the Made in China twenty twenty five initiative. So I just to to see what it spat out basically. So it says China's become global leader in electric vehicles, which I know to be true. Uh, in solar pa in solar energy solar panels um and drones and unmanned aerial vehicles they've got the largest high speed high speed rail network 
um, and one of the largest robot robotics and automation uh, industries, as well as 5G, they're one of the world leaders on. Um, and then it goes on, there's, there's a lot of stuff here. But basically it's saying that it kind of made at least some progress towards this and that by 2049, they aim to be the sole leading global technical superpower. So I, it seems like they're also thinking maybe if we decouple a little bit from the United States that they could accelerate ahead. Um, is that... <laughs> I'm not sure I wouldn't perhaps go that far. So just to take a step back to Made in China 2025. So I think China has absolutely become a global leader in five of the, the technologies that were prioritized in this, in this strategy. So you mentioned drones, solar panels, graphene is another one, mm. high-speed rail, electric vehicles, and also um, LNG carriers. And they have made progress on uh, some of the others. So commercial aircraft, semiconductors, AI, robots, machine tools, large tractors, and drugs. But they are quite far behind on semiconductors, and it's quite hard to catch up for some of the reasons that I've, that I've identified. Now, what are they trying to do? Are they trying to become the sole global technological superpower no i don't think that's their objective i think they want to um they want to become a technologically leading country by 2049 it doesn't mean that they want to crush everybody else and everybody else goes you know back to living in caves or something like that it's the the aspiration is that china becomes a high tech high value added moderately prosperous um, society as they put it so what they're trying to do is what most developing countries want to achieve which is to escape the so-called middle income trap so the way that the way that most developing countries have the successful ones have developed is by inserting themselves inserting parts of their economy into uh, regional or global production networks. So they attract companies that are offshoring. They insert. They attract um, manufacturing capital. They they start with you know very basic stuff like garments. That's very low like low tech, low wage, low value added. But it, you get you earn a little bit of money out of that. But then you want to climb up the value added ladder. So you go to more more technologically complex goods. You might move into. Um, you know, basic electronics assembly or something like that, you know, putting together an iPhone. And that gets you a little bit further and allows you a little bit more wealth to be captured in that economy. But a lot of countries stall at that point. They don't take the next step into the most technologically complex forms of production where you earn a, a lot of income, a lot of revenue. You're able to, to extract a lot of value. So if you think about an iPhone production, for example, you know, the iPhone is assembled entirely in China. And back in 2011, it was calculated that um, the, the Chinese got about $3 per handset because what? although really? they were putting it together, all the components were coming from elsewhere. Uh, a lot of the components were being imported from places like Taiwan, South Korea, and of course, the lion's share of the final retail um, price was taken by Apple because they owned the intellectual property mm. of the Apple iPhone. And so they could extract the lion's share, hundreds of dollars out of the final retail sale price. Mm. Now, that has now changed. So because China has been able to develop its own um, industry to produce some of these components, now is something like... 20% of the value of an iPhone is retained in China by Chinese firms because they've been developing these new technologies. So, for example, like the screen or the casing and things like that, they don't need to import these things anymore. So Chinese firms get more value out of the production of the iPhone. It's not only, you know, the, the highly exploited workers putting the components together on the assembly line, it's now the, the generation of these high-tech components. And this is what China's aiming to do. 
it's to is to drag itself up the value added ladder through intensive um indigenous innovation through acquiring foreign technologies either through joint ventures or forced technology transfers or industrial espionage or through mergers and acquisitions of of, of technology and it, it's it's incredibly successful at doing these things in a very short space of time and i think above all else it's doing it at enormous scale so the sheer the sheer size of china is what you know, causes it to have these global repercussions. So the fact that China has become this leading um, producer of solar panels, for example, is the reason why renewables are now so cheap that it's cheaper to install solar panels than it is to burn coal. Because just last year, the price of solar panels halved because there is so much, so many solar panels being produced really? in China. So it's not like a small economy like South Korea, which has developed in a relatively similar way. But, you know, South Korea is, as an economy, as, as a population, is relatively small. It's, it's smaller than the UK. So you can cope with that. But China is this massive continental economy with this enormous population. So it's doing all this at such enormous scale that it has this it creates economic shockwaves across the entire world. So if you're trying to create your own green transition in Europe by developing your own solar panel sector or your own electric vehicle sector, and Chinese companies are, you know, blasting their surpluses all across the world, how do you compete? That's the challenge in a lot of these areas. And then, of course, because China is moving very quickly, in these high tech areas, there's also potential, you know, military spillover of these technologies. So it's economically threatening to Western powers that are, you know, been stagnating economically, technologically, in terms of productivity for a long time. Whereas China has had, you know, decades of breakneck uh, growth, very high rates of investment, very high rates of um, technological progress and so that gap between the, the powers is narrowing and that's what i think freaks out a lot of people in washington mm. do you run a business of any kind do you want 25 percent off up to 20 taxi rides well if you sign up to bolt business with my promo code that's exactly what you'll get you don't have to use all 20 rides and you can use it for your own business rides or for your employees it couldn't be simpler Follow the link in the description and use the code BB25 off 20 to get 25% off 20 taxi rides today. That's BB25 off 20. Hey everyone, thanks for making it right the way to the end of the podcast. I love that you tuned in this long. Do me a favor, hit subscribe because 80% of you bastards are not subscribing, but you're watching my videos. See you next time.